Um, thank you all for being here today and for having me. Uh, my name is Rufka Chasen, and today I'm going to focus less on the raw material itself and more on the distribution and um, kind of patterns we see within these decorated basalt vessels. Now, the Calcolithic period in the southern Levant is from approximately 45 to 3900 calibrated BC, and the time span isn't so different from, you know, the preceding pottery Neolithic. We still have the same small-scale agro-pastoral communities, but we do start to see notable changes, including economic and technological developments, uh, social developments with new burial practices, of course, copper and the beginning of craft specialization. And intertwined with all of this, in the Southern Levant, as we see an increase in regionalization with clear differentiation between the North and South. And of course, you know, these terms are always relative, but the South in this case is basically everything south of modern day Tel Aviv. So common to the north, we see some unique items, including basalt pillar figurines and perforated flint discs, while common to the south are items like copper, ivory, cornets, um, and micro bladelets and, um, and scrapers. And while these boundaries can you know, sometimes blur that they aren't perfect, um, most researchers were seeing as we excavate more and more that these patterns are kind of pretty clear and stable. At the same time, we notice an incredible increase in the frequency of basalt vessels. Basalt vessels um, usually form about 15 to 30 percent of a groundstone tool's assemblage, but at some sites they can form 60 percent or even more, um, meaning they can outnumber you know, utilitarian grinding tools and should therefore be considered at least um, equally as important. But we see them primarily at settlement sites. Um, located all, of, all across the southern Levant, even at sites, you know, over 60 kilometers away from potential basalt sources. And we also occasionally see them in burial caves. And the vessels are made in two main forms. You have the flat-based V-shaped bowl. And second, you have this fenestrated pedestal vessel, which is made from a solid piece of basalt. So you have that very same V-shaped bowl sitting on top of a pedestal base that someone has gone in, hollowed out, and carved three or four windows into. And um, despite their high frequency and presence at domestic sites, uh, I like to think, and there are some people who argue against this, that these are probably somewhat of a utilitarian but somewhat prestige item, um, in part because of the non-local nature of the raw material. Um, obviously, 60 kilometers, you know, isn't the most, the greatest distance to travel, but for basalt, um, to import either the finished product or the raw material isn't so easy. These things are heavy. You know, we're talking about a bowl with sometimes a diameter of 55 centimeters. It's big. Um, and second, that it requires, you know, a high amount of skill and effort to produce these, uh, especially with the fenestrated vessels that when you form these, um, there must be an incredible risk of just breaking the vessel. And all of this is particularly notable considering that we have pottery now, so you don't actually need a stone vessel. It's completely irrelevant. And in addition, the value of these was sometimes supplemented by the application of decoration. The decoration was usually incised, but we also have some formed in relief, which is just technologically slightly different, where you're removing the material from around decoration by incising and abrading. Now, over the course of my research, I personally studied the decorated basalt vessels from 17 Calcolithic sites, and then, of course, conducted an overwhelmingly extensive literature review and found hundreds more um, spread throughout the southern Levant. We do see kind of concentrations here, or that we have in the south, in the northern Negev region, and in these kind of central coastal plain and valleys. And what we see is that further north, um, decoration is less common and it doesn't seem to be so much of an excavation bias because in Israel, you know, we excavate where we build and we build everywhere. Um, decoration is usually applied on about 11 to 36 percent of the fragments at a given site. But of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, 11 to 36 percent of the vessels were decorated. Um, when I work on an assemblage, of course, I try to refit them. But even then, you know, the minimum number of vessels isn't necessarily the most representative, that we never quite come to kind of forming even what you would call an incomplete vessel. So we're dealing with something that's very highly fragmented. But what I do think you can see here is that there is no you know, one site 
with an overwhelmingly high frequency of decorated basalt vessel fragments that could represent a decoration production center. Um, even though this is problematic because um, just incising basalt doesn't leave you know, much of a trace in the production. Um, so the only thing you could really have to identify it would be perhaps an overwhelming high frequency of decorated vessels. Now the most common decoration form are these incised triangles placed around the rim area. They're formed by two incised lines and then kind of the third line is the triangle, is the vessel rim. And this design has a pretty wide distribution used um, all the way from the northern Negev to our lower Galilee and can be applied on sometimes on up to 60% of the rim fragments at a given site. What we see is that these triangles are usually placed on the interior rim, which um, when you start to think about it more is actually a bit logical because with open form vessels, it's placed like we're talking about really, you know, open form vessels that it's, it's placed below eye level actually easier to see the decoration on the interior rim. These triangles are also usually filled with oblique hatches that have a directionality to them, the angle from the upper right corner to the lower left side. We can also see some sort of general patterns in the triangle morphology. They're usually about 100 to 400 millimeters squared, proportionally wide, acute, formed with three angles less than 90 degrees, and they have an immense um, symmetry to them, where that the opposite sides are more or less the same. Now the next key decoration form are these raised bands, which is the only decoration form we see during this period made in relief. Um, the bands also have the widest distribution used in basically all of modern day Israel. And we see them applied to a wide variety of vessel forms, but mainly on these fenestrated vessels. And generally the bands are placed less than 15 millimeters above the vessel base formed with a convex cross section, and it's generally one band per vessel. And to recap, what we see here within the triangles and raised bands is an overwhelming sense of uniformity. And because of this, if we look at vessels from Beersheba in the northern Negev, from near Tel Aviv in the central coastal plain, and from near Haifa in the lower Galilee, we see that all the vessels and all the decorations look more or less the same, that you cannot differentiate them. Yet we don't see here a single clear production center, and maybe one day we'll find it, but as of yet, it seems that multiple individuals or perhaps multiple smaller centers are producing these decoration <coughs> forms while using the same general guidelines. But aside from triangles and raised bands, on a more limited number of vessels, we see um, the so-called elaborate decoration, which isn't just one motif, it's multiple motifs used in combinations. And we have a couple of geometric motifs, including um, incised parallel horizontal lines, herringbone, diamonds, cross hatching, alternating hatch triangles, and more. And there's a high degree of variability, but within this, we note two general patterns. First, parallel horizontal lines aren't, you know, a motif or whatever in their own right. They're almost always very clearly used to frame the other motifs and create kind of a sense of order to the vessel. And second, these elaborate motifs are often paired with the triangles on the rim area. On 90% of the rim fragments and complete vessels, we see triangles on the interior rim. And on 9%, we also see triangles on the exterior rim. So it shows that the two motifs can be used in combination, and they don't represent necessarily um, two different production <coughs> strategies or cultural variation or chronological variation, that they're really tied together. And we can see that these elaborate decorations are very clearly used to cover the entirety of flat face vessels, but with fenestrated forms, it's a bit more complicated because um, the fenestrated vessels that we're seeing decorated are highly fragmented and all we have are the leg or ring based fragments. And it's further aggravated by the fact that at several sites with these fenestrated forms, um, we don't have any even rim or wall fragments. So this could suggest that if the fenestrated forms were fully decorated, then we may be looking at some deliberate fragmentation and a separation between the bull and the fenestrated pedestal base. And then there's still though the question of where's the bull because we, we haven't found it yet. So far, um, 78 of such fragments have been published. I know of a few more, but it still follows you know, this general distribution and low frequency. And we see that the vessels are used um, from the northern Negev and through the Jezreel Valley in the north and the Jordan Valley in the east. And the triangles and raised bands 
are both used much further north. What we see is that at most sites, we're usually talking about one to four of such fragments, although there are a few sites with a bit more. And just to talk about frequency, uh, elaborate decoration is usually applied on about 4 to 11% of the fragments at a given site. In contrast, at these very same sites that um, I could calculate the frequency for, triangles are used on 8 to 30% of the fragments, so significantly more. What we're seeing is that these elaborate decorations form a very small percentage of the decorated vessels, and of course, at most sites, there are none. So these, if we're going to say that these elaborate decorations um, perhaps added more value to the vessels, um, first, that they just required more time and skill to produce. To put this in perspective, for me to form, after some practice, one triangle on a piece of basalt with the hatches and everything takes six minutes. So, and it's not even so pretty. Um, so we're talking about here, you know, probably a full day of work to decorate a vessel with decoration you don't need for a vessel you don't even need. And in addition, while the same geometric motifs are being used, on no two vessels are they arranged in the exact same way. So each one is one of a kind, and this gives it, you know, immense amounts of value. And these elaborately decorated basalt vessels also share this, you know, southern prestige item distribution network that we see very clearly, for example, with copper and ivory. And this suggests, perhaps, that there was um, a southern prestige item distribution network and that the more northern sites didn't have something of value or of equal value to give an exchange, or perhaps you know, they didn't consider these decorations and these vessels valuable. And it's particularly unusual considering that some of our major basalt sources come from these northern regions. So the vessels themselves most likely originated from there. So they were coming down undecorated and then decorated and then not redistributed further north, most likely. And what we're seeing here um, is also that the distribution is again more limited than the more conventionally decorated and then the undecorated basalt vessels. So what we're getting at is that there should be a separate production and distribution network for these. We see that these elaborately decorated basalt vessels though, like almost all the other basalt vessels, are primarily found at domestic sites. So far, I've only seen them in one burial cave, Shoham, and this shows that the elaborately decorated basalt vessels had value and probably a practical function in domestic contexts, and that people actively chose not to bring them into mortuary contexts, which is unusual, because other prestige items are incorporated into burial caves. Um, and it means then that, that people actively chose not to bring them there, maybe because that the function itself was only in utilitarian contexts, or maybe they were too valuable to take out of circulation and incorporate into burial caves. And finally, if we look outside of the basalt vessel industry, we do see parallels to these motifs on other mediums, particularly pottery and copper items. And with pottery, we see these motifs incised and painted on a wide variety of vessel forms in the Calcolithic period and even slightly before. So what we're looking at is probably a motif and a kind of style that was borrowed from the pottery industry and then replicated on basalt, um, given extra value just by the sheer difficulty in incising the basalt. So to summarize, um, during the Calcolithic period, we really see an immense increase in the frequency of decoration. If we look at all the preceding periods with basalt vessels, um, maybe one to 12, a dozen, maybe a little more, are decorated with various you know, inconsistent motifs with no clear patterns. But during the Calcolithic period, we all of a sudden start to see hundreds of basalt vessel fragments um, formed with conventional decoration forms, the triangles and raised bands that were formed in accordance with accepted guidelines and kind of link Calcolithic communities across the southern Levant with um, maybe symbolic tradition or at the very least um, a, productive, um, a decoration productive tradition. But the elaborate decoration um, is something different entirely. It speaks a different story. Um, with no clear standardization and a more limited production and distribution. And these could represent in a part, you know, an attempt to break the rules by creating something that doesn't follow any guidelines. And you know, you go beyond the conventional formulations, and in doing this, you create something of immense value, um, which again, it could relate the differences here. It could relate to perhaps a different function to these, or perhaps a separate production. But I want to reinforce that what we're seeing here is not a form of 
of a counterculture where we don't have, you know, the people using triangles on the one hand, and then a separate group saying, um, we hate the triangle people, we're going to make elaborate decoration, something crazy, waste a lot of our time, but make something beautiful. Um, instead, you know, these re relate to, you know, the value of the vessels themselves and the effort that goes behind creating the decoration forms. Finally, I would like to thank all the researchers who allowed me to study their decorated basalt vessels and all of you for being here today. Thank you.